Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Crockett from Dairy Sustainability Ireland and Noel Meehan from Chagask, uh, Ch- the, the program manager of the Chagask Asset Program. We're also joined by Porrick Foley in Chagask in Wexford, who's going to be assisting with the questions later on. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome to today's uh, webinar. Noel, you've been a program manager for the ASAP program for the last number of years. Could you just give us a quick uh, a snapshot of what the, the ASAP program is about before we launch into the main session today? Um, where I can, Mark, I suppose Joe's, Joe and myself are probably going into a lot more detail about look at the, the ASAP program is, is a, a service that's been provided to farmers on a voluntary basis and its uh, purpose is really is to help farmers, you know, put in um, practices and, and actions that will help uh, reduce the losses of nutrient sediment and, and pesticides to, to water with a view to improving water quality and it's, it's a broad collaboration across the industry. Uh, with, with Get into that in more detail later on, but it's it's look okay, it's it's a it's a it's a new way of thinking of new way of trying to improve water quality. So you know, so far so good. I think that the collaboration is the the key word, Joe. Would you agree that around the the ESA program? Yeah, it is about um, treating everybody like they're adults. Uh, it's a change from kind of hard enforcement into an involvement in a collaborative process, one with farmers and suppliers, but also with uh, kind of other agencies like the departments. Um, the local authorities, the EPA, Board B, and so on and so forth. It's, it's uh, collaborative. Right, great. Okay, so we're going to um, have a presentation from Joe for starters, and then Noel, you're going to give, show a presentation after that. So, um, Joe, if I could ask you to share your screen with us, and uh, we will hand the stage over to you uh, for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to you afterwards, Joe. So what I want to talk about this morning is kind of the ASAP program, but also the, the broader kind of policy background, uh, which sort of is to start with agri-economy, because that's what I became interested in beginning. then to look at kind of the broad sustainability calls to action, how we establish the Dairy Sustainability Initiative or Dairy Sustainability Ireland, and then to work down through different issues, as you can see there. We're going to start with, with the agri-economy. Um, so back after the crash in 2008, 2009, the state was trying to work out how it could recover. Uh, and in particular, how what was what were the indigenous sectors that you, know, that you could, could uh, support. So there was a particular focus on agriculture and tourism, as you can see there. And obviously, everybody's familiar with food harvest and food rise. Uh, and what they aimed to do. Now, the, the great news is with those two policy programs is that they were incredibly successful. There was major public policy and private success and great credit factors due to the people who drafted it up and everybody who was involved in making it happen. But I think that provides a template for us, that kind of approach, whole of sector, whole of government, um, unified around a kind of a, a set of objectives. That the fact that there was success with those two programs means that there can be confidence that there can be success around the next one, which will really be focused on sustainability and kind of overarching policy will be due in the next couple of months. I think it's fair to also acknowledge the great success that Board BIA has been with the Origin Green uh, programme, and that was kind of focusing on sustainability uh, as a supply chain verification process, uh, and it was a major international success and very helpful again to, to, to both food life and food harvest. Um, so in terms then of kind of the metrics as to what the business, what were the economic impacts, all these figures that you see on the screen, all positive, all very, very good and, you know, as strong as could be. Um, so here are also some other metrics in relation to kind of how the sector has grown uh, and the numbers employed and the amount of uh, revenue export that it brings in and the indirect service jobs. And again, the the key understanding in relation to this is that when you kind of consider how is rural Ireland or Ireland outside the cities to develop against the backdrop of legacy FDIs kind of dying out and kind of the focusing of FDI knowledge economy into the cities. The question then is how does Ireland outside the the cities live uh, and survive and sustain the future? And clearly it is around sustainable agriculture that that's really where the answer is. 
So in terms then of kind of the impact of milk alone, this figure blew my mind when, it, when I saw it, um, that it's 2.6 billion in checks to farmers alone in the 26 counties in 2019. And when you break that into a county by county figure, uh, again, it, it becomes staggering. Um, for Cork, for example, for day gold, I think it's 500 million per annum uh, in checks to the farmers, uh, again, for, on the back of kind of very hard work being done by the farming sector to make that happen. Um, but there is no FDI company delivering checks worth 500 billion, uh, 500 million to the Cork economy. Likewise, for the big dairy uh, counties, uh, you'd expect good numbers there for Tipperary and Kilkenny, and they are true. But even for the likes of Leash, I think the figure is 70 million per annum coming from Glanvia. So these are kind of e e uh, important economic development and economic sustainability um, pillars, uh, and, and they should be understood as such. But like economics on its own is no good to anybody unless it's sustainable. And clearly there have been very significant calls to action for the five sustainability pillars, as you can see there, that people would be familiar with from, from the recent presentations of which obviously as well soil productivity is a, is a key pillar uh, because we know that only about 14% of the soils of Ireland are at peak productivity and that's from Dr. David Wall. And even though that number has been kind of gradually increasing, there is still a lot, there's a good distance to travel in relation to improving soil productivity and therefore improving farming. The other interesting thing about the sustainability pillars is that if you start to fix one, you start to fix them all. Uh, so there are commonalities and interdependencies and co-benefits. So there is now kind of an emerging view that the more joint approach that you have to, to farm sustainability, uh, the more beneficial it is across the entire five sustainability pillars, and that there are benefits for the environment, for the farmers, for business, and for the economy if we get it right. And of course, we have to get it right. So now we have kind of new strategic calls for action, the, of which the most significant, obviously, is the very big ask that's in the programme for government under all those headings. The EU Green Deal would be familiar with, Farm to Fork familiar with, CAP reform and eco schemes familiar with. But the latest one to come on to the runway for want of a better description is the, is the recovery program from Brussels, uh, which uh, you know, has been kind of talked about over the, uh, and signed off in recent days. What isn't really well understood and it is kind of only emerging is that they are now talking about that as a green recovery, a, a green economic recovery. So that's another dimension uh, to all of this. And as well, obviously, for dairy farmers, the derogation review is, will be commencing kind of imminently with, with uh, you know, in the next week or so um, with, with public consultation launched by the Department of Agriculture. But when you put all this together, it amounts to very significant tasks for agri and for agri industry. And therefore, systemic responses are needed to surpass and overcome these particular challenges. So just to get some background in relation to Dairy Sustainability Ireland, it started out as a Dairy Sustainability Initiative. Um, and it started from a kind of a premise that environmental sustainability and economic sustainability are complementary. Now, our understanding of that has actually changed since the programme started. And we now are of the view that actually there is the same thing, that economic sustainability and environmental sustainability are the same thing. You can't have one without the other. So this was kind of the first agri-industry sustainability involving the whole of government and whole of sector, that's the dairy sector. And it was set up to address water, soil and air quality climate change on a multi-annual basis to start us down the journey of food wise, uh, of the food wise sustainability objective. These are all the kind of participants, uh, very broad chart you see on the top line are all of the companies that are involved. Second line are all of the farm bodies and third line are the government agencies. Uh, and really sort of the intent, so these are the, the kind of the dairy companies that are, that are involved. Um, uh, and again, they're all the principal players, as you'd expect, and familiar names to all of the, of the, of, of the farm community that would be looking at this. Um, so these were the kind of principles that we were trying to embed, on, starting on the left, that would be whole of sector, whole of government, that would be collaborative, and that would be agreement on common plans and objectives. That the Dairy Sustainability Forum would provide an opportunity for discussion of new ideas and issues and sharing of everybody's perspective that it would involve the stakeholder consultation and that there would be particular subject matter experts brought in from the outside to help thinking and for us all to have a kind of a common agenda and a common platform to see what was coming down the track. And then that, that you know, things could be developed from there. But again, this was another underpinning understanding. 
In other words, that there was a kind of an overlap between what the regulatory side, the government side, was looking for from, from, from regulatory risk and you know new laws and so on, for new policies, to what the market was looking for. The market, whether they are considered consumers in, in Asia or, or or in America or anywhere else, or business to business companies, they're looking for evidential sustainability requirements, uh, and also that then brings into question as to permission from the from from society to operate. And then that is also, as I mentioned, linked to on-farm productivity because soy productivity is so low. There's a major opportunity there, which can previous speakers have referenced. So there's an overlap between these three uh, understandings. And this is the essence of it, that company sustainability, farmer income, and environmental outcomes are all kind of interlinked. So that brings us to ASAP. Uh, and ASAP was a part of the second water catchments program. Uh, and the idea was that there would be 30 sustainability advisors, 20 from Chagas, 10 from the processing co-ops. Uh, the 20 from Chagas would be funded by the Department of Agriculture and by the Department of uh, Housing Planning and Local Government. Um, alongside 35 scientists from the local authorities and 12 community advisors, all trained together to the same standard by the EPA. Uh, and that has now been operating for two years and has been good progress. It is a unique public sector industry sustainability initiative. There's nowhere else. Like, but it is only a pilot program. It's only, it is only small, and it is only just you know, starting two years. It's really, it's really very early days. So these are the companies that are involved in it. So again, all very familiar names. It's the nine processing co-ops. Uh, you know, so all kind of very good uh, contribution by by those companies. They all have their own sustainability advisor, and they all have networks around them in their individual companies with big buy-in from the executive and from the boards and so on and so forth. So they they have been operational now for the past two years. Uh, we had an interim report just recently, um, and again, the, the, the core principles that you'll see, and again, I think it's fair to call out the Department of Ag and the Department of Housing, Crossing Co-ops, Chagas, Glauco, Farm Bodies, Farmers themselves, and also good support from Board B and the EPA. And also to pay tribute to Noel Meehan himself and to Carl McCarthy, who's leading on the law pro side. And very good. Collaboration is not an easy way to do business, but actually it's, it's paying off in this sense. So we have a philosophy that, you know, there's a kind of unique approach for, for dealing with each farmer's land is different. It's not one size fits all, and it's the right measure in the right place. Uh, and it's an alternative to enforcement and it's free and confidential. So that's kind of what ASAP is about. So the the principles that sort of flow from those in terms of possible options and approaches to responding to the new significant calls for action that you know the state and the EU and business is looking for. So again, we the key really to my mind is scientific standards. Uh, that if we are to respond to the program for government, the Green Deal, Farm to Fork, the EU Green Recovery, Cap Reform, it has to be to a scientific metric, and it really has to be whole of government, whole of sector, uh, joined up policies, programs, grants, public and private. You know that there can't. This really has to be a very full collaborative, integrative process, joined up. And agreed strategies joined up and agreed messaging, communications, knowledge trans transfer. And it should be developmental, it should be positive, it should be progressive, building on the ASA principles. In other words, that if people are sort of feel that they have to do this, you know, because somebody has their armor behind their back, that's no good. It really has to be, you have to be wholehearted on this because there's such great wins to be achieved from it. So, and to apply the same developmental approach, processes, resources, and structures as food harvest and food wise delivered in order to get the very big results that everybody is looking for. So these are kind of the core strategies that flow from the Chagas Mac, Mac curve in terms of taking the Mac curve and turning it into strategy and possibilities. So the first set of first bullet points there you'll be familiar with in terms of end reductions on farm nutrient management planning, widespread use of clover, more lime and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, the, the, those are kind of the key elements. Uh, so we are, the co-ops with Chagas and the department are developing a first phase, which we will be rolling out later on in the year, which was five switches, uh, you know, to, to, to reduce uh, chemical and improve, uh, improve lime, um, over so clover, those sorts of things. Uh, and again, I think sort of the question of the integration of sustainability advisory knowledge transfer, a little bit of rural woodland on farms, shelter belt stuff, repositioning of commercial forestry, energy reductions. And the numbers financially for this kind of stuff are very big. The bioeconomy EU is 10 billion alone. Uh, and we now know, we know, know there's multi-billion uh, elements of that kind of been talked about previously. 
but it has to focus on water quality, greenhouse gases, ammonia, biodiversity, and soil productivity. In terms of elements to make it happen, I think there has been kind of discussion around the, where sustainability bonuses would, would fit in. Dairy Gold have brought in a sustainability bonus. Don B. have brought in a, a biodiversity bonus. So I think that's part of the policy mix that will have to be considered. The question of what advice and support you'd give to farmers to, you know, to guide as to how this should happen. Obviously, the review of ESTAS is, I think, is an opportunity. But the key requirement is the mainstreaming of sustainability into how everybody does business, not as some separate thing, not something that's external to the process. It has to be internal. And really, it points to an alignment of sustainability, public and private. And that and it then it points also to the, the, the need for the beginning of coalition building and integrated supportive sustainability strategies that, strategies that agencies need to work together. Uh, it, there can't be kind of solo runs, working with the farm bodies, working with the departments, working with the local authorities, working with the EPA, working with Board B, working with the farm bodies, all the stakeholders in order to get the right thing done. And I was very taken by this in the Ag Climatized uh, document, you know, talked about new partnerships. And it particularly referenced the Dairy Gold Milk Supplier Sustainability Bonus and the Glambia Ireland Keepak Calf to Beef Club, which I thought were really interesting. And it also pointed to the urgent need for similar type programs and using current for partnerships to move things on. Um, this is kind of the, the last slide. Ness produced a research paper on this last year with a very heavy hitter external professor coming in from Colombia, Professor Charles Stable, director of, of, of Ness, Rory O'Donnell. Uh, and also Dr. Larry O'Connell produced this very fine research paper. And they said they looked at all of the entire dairy sector, the Chagas Board, BIA, ESTAS, the Sustainability Initiative, Smart Farming, and said, look, you have all the different elements there to make great things happen. Uh, and in the very last line, what's relevant? And they said, well, might it be that in the moment of our need, we happen to create the novel organization resource which to learn by deliberate self-organization to solve the environmental problems we face. And I would act I, I would recommend that people would have a look at that because I think there's very good stuff in there. So in terms of what does success look like, um, and it has to be success to, to scientific standard, Foodwise had this statement in, it in, in 2015, and I think it catches really the element, the, the essence where we need to go, that we have in second bullet point, we have to address and surpass the significant challenges for you know, the, the, the sustainability pillars if the economic gains are to be achieved. And it says, third bullet point, significant effort, um, uh, scientific evidence and ambition for Ireland to be a world leader in sustainable growth as a market strategy and I think that really is the, the essence of it. So just to say thanks to all the farmers and suppliers who are working with this, all the supporting departments and agencies, Chagas and local authorities, the farm bodies and the companies and say thanks very much indeed for, for listening. Joe, thanks very much for that uh, excellent presentation, a good overview of the, the ASA programme and the wider uh, dairy sustainability uh, forum. Um, so, so Noel, I'm going to ask Noel to, to get his presentation ready if uh, you're there, Noel. Um, yeah, I'm here. Your, your camera with us. So, uh, just a reminder to people that you can submit your questions using the QA tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've had a few inquiries as to whether the presentation will be available afterwards, and it will indeed be on the Chagas website along with the recording of today's uh, webinar will be available on the Chagas YouTube site. So uh, a good resource. Uh, we're, we're getting good feedback from people, particularly in the, the education sector, uh, that this is a, a good re resource, useful resource for, for teaching purposes. Um, so uh, do feel free to, to have a look at the, the playlist available on the Chagas YouTube channel. Noel, um, you're all ready to go there, so we'll ask you to, to give your presentation and uh, we will talk to you afterwards. Okay, thanks Mark and thanks Joe for setting the scene there very well. Um, I suppose I, I'm working with the ASAP program and I suppose the ASAP is uh, looking at agriculture and, and working with agriculture to, with, with a view to improving water quality. You know, there's multiple pressures out there uh, from wastewater treatment, forestry, industry, and so on. But I suppose ASAP is, is, is just focused on the water quality side. Uh, again, I'd like to reiterate Joe's um, comments about the collaboration. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is what, it is what the whole ASAP is based on. And uh, I think it's important to acknowledge you know, the contribution of the farm, um, of the, the co-ops, the, the departments, uh, the farming organizations, you know, we're all intertwined together. Uh, working for with one common goal, which is to improve water quality. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge the buy-in of, of the farmers into the program. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the key players in this. And they have, so far we have up again 96% of farmers have engaged with us once we, we've contacted them, which is fantastic. And it goes to show how open farmers are to working with us on this. And like that, I, I think it, that's down very much to the way the advisors have um, engaged with the farmers and brought them along and explained what we're about. So I think that the advisors need to be acknowledged as well for the, the crucial role they are providing or they're they are doing it with the asset. They're providing a, a confidential service, a voluntary service, non-regulatory service, and you know they, they, they're doing that really, really well. Um, just to move on, I'll uh, give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to maybe look back a little bit at the whole signpost series, particularly the water quality focus part of it, and just to try and tie it all in together. Um, I'm going to talk about how we engage with farmers uh, at a catchment level, and then I'm going to ex uh, give you a quick um, look at how we uh, uh, carry out a farm assessment and a farm plan and what we look for. So I suppose just to, to uh, maybe look back a little bit, um, the signpost series and the water quality focus, we, we're looking at, you know, trying to give a picture to all the uh, viewers there to over the last seven or eight uh, webinars as to what uh, water quality, it's a very complicated um, uh, uh, field and, you know, we would have to try and put all the different parameters together. So we had Ginny Deacon from the EPA kind of giving us a, an overview of, of what the water quality is and the trends and the, and the, and the regulatory requirements. We had Cara Richards talking about nitrogen and soil interaction and how uh, nutrient is lost, in, uh, nitrogen is lost in, from the soil and Karen Daly did uh, something similar with the phosphorus and we also had Dara Hulakon and Owen Finton talking about um, hydrogeology and sediment and critical source areas. With Mark Plunkett and David Wall talking about nutrient use efficiency and improving our nutrient usage and last week we had Ruth Hennessy from Rawpo talking about catchment science and I suppose what I'm trying to get across here is you know these are all the 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 building blocks that an asset advisor needs to have a, a handle on in order to come up and do a farm assessment and come up with a farm plan. And you know, we have to draw from all of those uh, areas when we're out in the farm and, and, and to identify the correct um, area and the correct issue at a farm level. So it's, it's quite a complex process, but you know, that's what the asset advisors have to do. I think it's important just to uh, maybe reiterate that uh, this morning. So the public and farmer engagement, uh, last week, uh, Ruth Hennessy spoke a lot about how Law Pro engaged with the public um, through their various meetings and, and so on and so forth. And it's important that um, as an asset service that we do so the same with, with the farmers. So we run a farmer information meeting at every, in every PAA or every catchment that we work on, every priority for area for action. And the whole point of this is to provide information on what the quality of the water is in the local stream, uh, what a farm assessment would look like, uh, what the mitigation action that we might be asking farmers to do. And this is a very crucial part of it because, you know, farmers want to know what, why the water in their local stream is impacted. You know, for in their own mind, they, they may not be an intensive farmer, yet their, their uh, water quality is impacted. So what's happening there? When, once they understand that, they're more open to taking on board the suggestions or the mitigation actions that we might suggest to them. Uh, so it's a very important process and uh, you know, it, it's something that we, we need to uh, work really hard on and, and keep, keep the focus on. So I suppose just to give a, a kind of a, how does it work, you know, maybe follow on from what Ruth was talking about last, last week, um, you know, the law pro, they go out, the teams, they go out, they assess the stream, you know, they do the death study, uh, chemical, biological, hydromorphological, stream walks, et cetera. So what they're trying to do there is build up a picture of, of the of the catchment. And I'm just going to give you a, a kind of hypothetical example of, of one. This is not um, an actual one, but just to say, for example, for this morning, um, we have a catchment there, you know, a barra catchment in Wexford. And, you know, if we were looking at, at a water body here, this Bracken 10 water body, uh, the status of the water is, is moderate, so it's, it's not reaching the standard of, of good status. So how would we maybe narrow down where the, where the issues is, are in that catchment? Um, you know, you have a northern stream and you have a southern stream. So, you know, the law pro team would do their assessments and they might come back to the southern stream is, is of good standard. So 
that would mean that you know we don't really need to look at any farmers down this area here. The northern stream, you, you know, when we go when they go assessing us, you would see maybe uh, some problems there. But as you farther the farther you go up along the stream, you would see that uh, water quality is improved. So at that stage, then you know, all probably in a, in, a, in a position to give us a refer to say these these three streams here. Um, the farmers that work around there, they're, they're, those are the farmers that we need to need you guys to go out and to talk to and to engage and see what the story is. So that's, that's just a, a practical example of how it would work on the ground. Um, so I suppose what we, what we have to do then is, is to um, go and assess the farms and, and, and take into account the, the specific nature of each individual farm. So, you know, we're, we're very much doing a, a tailored um, farm specific plans for each farm so you know as Joe mentioned earlier on moving away from the one size fits all this is very much about getting the correct identifying the, the, the issues and provide putting in the correct measure in the correct place um, and that this is crucial because you know each farm is different uh, each farmer's circumstances are different you know we need to make sure that we do this correctly so in this example we're looking at a phosphorus and sediment loss issue and um, you know it's important to note that Three quarters of all the, the issues that we're finding in streams are as a result of diffuse phosphorus loss, diffuse sediment loss, and diffuse nitrogen loss. So three quarters of, of, of what we're finding are in these three areas here. So what causes diffuse P and sediment loss? And just to do a little bit of recap from what Karen Daly would have done, um, most losses are from low permeability soils. So when you have heavy rainfall, uh, the soil gets saturated, and this leads to overland flow of water. And phosphorus binds tightly to, to the soil particles and sediments, as, as was explained. And, you know, pea and soil sediment is washed off into the drains and streams. So what happens is a scenario like this, where you have uh, plant available phosphorus and phosphorus is bind, bound tightly to sediments, that you get uh, water flowing over the surface and into streams like that. And how do we, and the question is, how do we, how do we uh, prevent that? And this is another example where, where we have sediment getting into a river there. So it's it's quite a it's quite a widespread uh, problem um, out there, and it's it's again, what do we do with a farm to try and prevent that? And this is just a quick picture of of, uh, of the farm assessment sheet that we use. We look at um, land farmyard issues, we look at land management issues, we look at nutrient management issues. But in this situation, it's it's pretty much focusing on we're pretty much focusing on uh, the land management issues, and uh, with particular reference to phosphorus loss through overland flow. And sediment loss and once we have identified on the farm the areas where, where these are, are issues well then we have to come up with mitigation actions and this is where the collaboration and, and the discussions uh, really comes to the fore so um, any mitigation actions we ask a farmer to take on you know it has to be in agreement with the farmer so the farmer has an input into what the plan is going to be there's no point in us asking the farmer to do something uh, that uh, he doesn't agree with and he hasn't any intention of doing. So we have to we have to work with the farmer, explain why such a measure is suitable. Uh, obviously, we have to sell it to the farmer. And look, at by and large, we're getting quite a good response. Which, uh, about 90% of, of the measures that we're asking farmers to take on, they're, they're agreeing to take them on. So I think the process is working very well from that point of view. Um, so... Uh, the mitigation actions here that we're looking at are repairing buffers, uh, management of critical source areas, and uh, hedgerows and and uh, buff and inf infield grass buffers and sediment traps. So that's the kind of thing that we'd be looking at, and you know a farmer would agree or, or not agree to those measures. So just to give the example here, this is uh, just a farm in the one of our that we were out in um, previously with the with the group on the training day. And you have a, a fall, the land falls quite steeply down towards uh, the top of the screen there and, and, this, and this river at the top of the field, or that drain at the top of the field. So how, how will we assess that farm and what will we look at? Um, this is the situation on the ground and you can see there that the stream again is on by the hedgerow, but there's a, there's a depression here in the middle of the field that area there. So that would possibly be identified as the critical source area for that field. So all the water um, in that field ends up pretty much landing in that point there. So, you know, this is very much, again, getting down to the specifics of each individual farm. So this gives a bit of information as to where we might want to try and focus our efforts with, with putting in the measures to prevent nutrient or prevent phosphorus and sediment loss into this stream up here, into this drain and off down into the main uh, stream network. So, you know, it, it's very important that we do this because, um, you know, traditionally people might have said, look, we'll go along and put a, 
put a, a riparian margin to full into the stream, but that quite clearly isn't necessary. The riparian margin needs to be put in, a, in an area where the water can access, and that's that's the, the key area there. Um, there's other the other thing that we spoke about, you know, maybe putting a hedge hedgerow up here, and um, that would break the flow of uh, sediment and water from flowing over. It would delay it. It would slow it down. It would give it a chance for it to to uh, to percolate it through the soil. Um, we could also maybe put in a, a sediment trap here at the outfall uh, before it joins the main river channel, and that would help to trap uh, sediment and prevent that from uh, getting down the stream. And we can also maybe use the whole field itself as as a as a grass buffer by allowing the grass to get that little bit longer. Uh, go a little bit longer over uh, the winter period where you have the most rainfall, the most chance of sediment loss. So that's the kind of stuff that we'll be talking about with farmers. Uh, again, it's about moving away from one size fits all. It's, it's, it's putting the right measure in the right place or the right combination of measures. And these are, are the airbags that we, we, you know, that, that are there to, you know, where a farmer uh, in the middle of summer might be doing everything right and you could get a flash uh, a week's heavy rain and the soil might be just, just gone out and these are the airbags there to try and trap that. So I suppose the next example we'll just look at it for completeness sake is, is diffuse nitrogen loss and again a little refresher from what, what causes diffuse nitrogen loss. It's, it's from free draining uh, soils usually is where we get the most losses from. Um, it doesn't bind tightly to, to the soil like phosphorus so it's, it's very mobile. Um, and you get a leaching where you have more in applied than what the plant needs. And excess in, so the, the, the in that's not grown by the plants that can be, or used by the plants that can be leached to, to uh, by range of the waters. And that's just a graphic of it. And, and look at, these are the, the phosphorus and sediment and the nitrogen. These are the, the, the three key things that we need to get across to uh, farmers, to advisors as well, that this, this is what's going on out there. And if we can identify these and put in the appropriate measures to, to mitigate against those, well, then we're, we're in a good place. Um, again, this is just a farm assessment sheet. And what we're looking at here is more along the line of nutrient use, uh, timing uh, of, of uh, fertilizer um, applications and the methods and so on, uh, the rates and weather and fertilizer management. So just to kind of give a quick summary on that, uh, you know, the right measure in the right place, or um, sorry, um, the right, the correct rate uh, of, of, uh, of nitrogen. So it's imp important that we put out the correct rate of nitrogen out there. Uh, and, you know, with that, maybe a, a accurate spreading equipment, have them make sure we have them cal um, calibrated. Um, you know, the right products, looking at urea, protect urea or less slurry and, and adjusting your nitrogen usage based on that, that you know, the, the availability of in is greater, so the chemical in can maybe dial back a, a bit on it. Timing is very important, particularly at the shorter periods of the year, um, you know, that we make sure that the, that the ground is uh, at the right temperature, the soil moisture deficit is correct, um, that we have growing periods, you know, that these are really, really important that we get, uh, we get the, the timing correct. And this will help improve our nutrient use efficiency as well. And in the correct location, in the correct fields, so fields that are, are prone to uh, leaching, and your driest fields that might be prone to leaching uh, at certain times of the year need to be launched. Also, just to look on maybe at the tillage side of the house, that we, we, we make sure we put in the, the cover crops there, the root system is, that is deeper, it, it mops up the uh, excess nitrogen in the soils and, you know, Autumn time is, is a big period for um, nitrogen leaching, and uh, it's important that, as far as we can, the tillage uh, crops are, are green or cover crops are covered or so on in tillage areas just to mop up that nitrogen. Um, just a quick look at the farm plan, and I suppose we're all familiar with the big glass plans or reps plans back in the day where there was pages and pages and pages of stuff. So what we wanted to do was to try and keep it as simple as ever we could. So we basically send out at, at most at least two pages, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, depending on how many maps we have. So we narrow it down to the three, four, maximum five main issues that are impacting water quality, the ones that we we're absolutely sure have an impact. We get agreement on mitigation measures and we send a letter out to the farmer just to remind them what those mitigation measures are, um, uh, what the advice is around that, and then where necessary, we, we would also send out a, a map similar to this kind of a map where we would show and indicate where measures are to be input. So we want to try and keep it as simple as possible because there's no point giving a farmer reams of pages of, of, of a plan, you just won't look at it. So we need to have it very simple. Um, I suppose just to summarize, 
Um, a couple of, couple of key points I want to get across. Uh, the challenge for, for us is that we get the measures implemented and maintained on farm. And, you know, we're, we're, we're um, out visiting farms and it, it's important that we get, get these things put in, otherwise we won't see water quality improvement. And just these two pictures, uh, this picture, the top picture was taken in January, the bottom picture was taken in, in July, a couple of weeks ago. And when I, what I'm talking about, this farmer already had that river fenced off, but you can see the stakes have fallen down, the wire is down, the grazing is going right up to the edge of, this, of the river. Um, it, has, it was put in, but it hasn't been maintained. So uh, our advisor has gone out, we, we asked him to put it back in again, and he has it back in now at this stage. But having it back in and letting it go back the way it was is, is, not, is not going to improve water quality. So we need to get the measures implemented and maintained on farm. And that is, is, is crucial. Uh, all, this, all that we spoke about up, up to now, the, all the webinars that we've spoken about, we will not get water quality improvement if we don't get implementation and maintenance of these measures on farm. And it's, it's, it's very important that we get that. Um, again, just to re-emphasize, re re we're collaborative, we're voluntary, it's non-regulatory. Um, very important that we get uniform messages across from all advisors and industry that, you know, that an ASPA advisor isn't saying one thing and then, the, uh, then you know, another advisor is saying something else. And again, just want to reiterate a, a thank you to all the, the farmers working with ASAP. Um, you know, they they're, uh, have a big ask of them. You know, I, I suppose they're, they're getting it, uh, getting feel sometimes that, that maybe they, they're being hung out to dry and a lot of things. But what we find is once you engage with them correctly, once you explain what you're about, um, give them an opportunity to have an, uh, an influence on what their plan is, um, you know, we, we're getting good buy-in, we're getting good good results from the point of view of, of that. So again, um, that's that's pretty much what I have to talk about this morning. Um, there's a couple of web links there uh, to uh, the ASAP interim report, the uh, the ASAP webpage, and also the signpost series webpage. And maybe if I have a, just enough, uh, a, a minute more, Mark, before I finish up, just to, just to maybe look at this picture that I have here. It's, it's a really good picture from the point of view that you have a river there along by the, by the hedge. Um, but the farmer, when we talk about putting in and, and maintaining and implementing and maintaining, this farmer has that stream fenced off since he was in reps. And you can see there's quite a good uh, margin there that is, is providing good protection. But not alone that, he has also extended that protection out past that when he put the silage. And again, even farther when he put out uh, his slurry. So, you know, that, that river has been given massive protection from uh, nutrient phosphorus overland flow loss, which is excellent to see. And, and the best thing is that he's maintaining it over a period of time. Two other little coal benefits that Joe spoke about. We have a nice little bit of biodiversity going on here. Okay, maybe um, it needs to be maintained and maybe the electric fence will get earthed, but um, the, the, that can be cut back and maintained. And he's also used low emission slurry spreading. So, you know, them are all uh, important and as advisors will, will certainly uh, offer uh, some guidance and advice on biodiversity and greenhouse gases when they're also um, out with the farm. So, look, Mark, that's, that's my uh, presentation. Sorry, I might have run over slightly on it, but um, that's it. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that, Noel. Excellent uh, presentation. And thank you both for staying on time. So if we could ask you to turn your, your cameras and your sound back on. Uh, Noel, what sort of engagement have you had with farmers? I mean, I, I see from the report uh, that there's been 96% of farmers approached through ASAP were uh, engaging willingly. But, uh, you know, how, how, what sort of, um, you know, what has been the reaction on the ground generally? And uh, we have a question here as well in terms of, has there been an opportunity to revisit the farms and, and assess what sort of uptake of the measures have, have been uh, implemented on mm -hmm. farms? Yeah, so I suppose just to the first part of your question there, you know, that the, the engagement has been, has been quite positive. Look at, you know, we, farmers, everybody is, is a little bit wary, you know, at first. Uh, well, not everybody, but, but sometimes farmers are a little bit wary at first. But I think that the process that we go through where, where we... Uh, try and um, inform them, talk with them, explain. You know, we're not going in pointing fingers. We're not going in accusing anybody. We're, we're there to work with them. We're there to help them provide, uh, come up with solutions. The collaborative, it's really important. I can't, I can't underemphasize enough 
or, or overemphasize enough the, the importance of that talking with farmers and, and coming in with them. And you know, once you, you talk to them, explain and uh, talk about what benefits this will be for agriculture in general and, and for their for their uh, industry, that helps build the picture. It helps put them at ease. And once they're once they're at ease, then they can they can understand or see um, why we're asking to put in a, a, a riparian margin, why we're asking to fence off a water force, because you know they, they understand then the impact that it's having. And you know, so far so good is it's working really well, and that's down to you know um, the work of the advisors, the twenty minutes, the ten the co-ops. They're they're all experienced advisors. They're they're used to doing this, so they're they're able to um, talk to farmers in and bring them along with them. Um, I suppose the second part of your question is we're uh, getting back out to farms, um, assess uh, to follow up visits to farms to see how. The level of implementation that's going on out there. So I suppose a couple of things on that. Um, we started visiting farms last May started. So you know we're only just over 12 months out visiting farms. Um, so we had started back uh, doing the follow-up visits at the start of the year and unfortunately COVID kicked in and we weren't able to get back out visiting farms. So uh, the level of implementation we haven't that fully established uh, for the farms that we visited already. Uh, we we're hoping to establish that over the summer. But that's like, look at it, I, I've already said it before, that is absolutely crucial. We have to get implementation of, of these measures out there and we will be encouraging and helping farmers as best we can to make sure that that happens. Um, you know, because it, it's, 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 one, it's one thing having good engagement and farmers uh, getting plans, it's another thing having good implementation and, and that's really where it's at. Thanks, thanks, Noel. Uh, Joe, uh, the the focus uh, obviously this program is is largely focused on not not talking about the asset program, but the dairy sustainability forum is focused uh, and driven by dairy farming sectors uh, sector. Are there plans to expand that to include other sectors such as beef and and uh, um, sheep, for example? Uh, I suspect that the Department of Agriculture. Uh, as it's now looking at kind of the new successor to Foodwise Food Harvest, we'll be looking at similar type structures or integrating those sort of structures in some particular way. But I think there will always be a need for a particular sectoral type focus as well, because kind of where dairy is at is, you know, in terms of kind of the, the, what, the what the platform does and the kind of the, the environment, uh, sustainability pressures that present, I think are, are particular to dairy and there needs to be a focus on, on that as well as for the other sectors also to do their thing to a greater degree. Uh, all, but all within an overarching, integrated, unified approach, as I said earlier, whole of government, whole of sector, is, is going to be our, man, is our mantra for quite some time. Okay. We have a question in here, uh, Joe. Um, it relates to, I suppose, the overall sustainability of, of the sector. The question reads, do you think that there is any correlation between the increased level of milk check payments to farmers um, and the overall decline in water quality, and more especially in County Cork, Limerick, Tipperary, where the level of dairy expansion has been dramatic, but the loss of habitat and water quality has also been dramatic. Should this be a measure of success for dairy sustainability Ireland? So quite a pointed question yeah. there. Well, I think that the, we're keeping a close eye on water quality trends and really the position had been up to relatively recently or up to about two years ago was that there had been no ship moving of the dial in relation to water quality. That, in other words, it was kind of fixed for the past couple of years and people couldn't make any level of improvement in relation to it. And that was part of the reason why the asset programme was, was set up because of the fact that it was seen that the existing mechanisms weren't working. So I think that actually there hasn't been a correlation as of yet in relation to dairy intensification and decline in water quality. I think the figure on average for more, I think there has been a kind of a beginning of a decline this year, uh, but people don't really know the reasons why, and that's being worked on at the present to see what were the causal factors. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, I think that there, that as Noel has mentioned, and as previous speakers have mentioned, I think there's a lot to be said for reducing chemical N. In dairy areas, uh, it is there is a lot of it being washed into to streams and so on and so forth. And it's just and at the end efficiency that Department of Agriculture and Chagas have mentioned that it, you know only about twenty five percent of nitrogen being being effective and being efficient. So I think there is a lot to be said for a straightforward focus on reducing end use, uh, and I think that's one of the key 
kind of messages that the, the sector needs to get out there that we need to actually just reduce the amount of end full stop. We've had, uh, and Joe, I know that the Dairy Sustainability Ireland is, is focused on much broader issues than just water quality, uh, greenhouse gas and, and biodiversity as well. The, the, um, the question has come up a number of times during this webinar series about the expansion in the dairy sector and how sustainable that is, the levels of expansion. Um, what, what's your view on that in terms of the, the numbers? A lot of people we hear calling for a reduction in numbers of, of cows in this country. What's, what's the, 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 the industry's response to that? Well, I think that obviously that sort of the sector is going to have to respond uh, and to comply with whatever it is that society and government and the EU asks. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that, whatever the state wants it gets, really, or what consumers want they get. Uh, so, but I think that sort of looking at it, that there's kind of two elements in my head. The first is that there has to be uh, full strategizing of the Chagas macro at the earliest opportunity, and that's why kind of the sector needs to uh, kind of step up to a greater degree in order to deliver this, the strategization of the Chagas macro. I think that's critical. Uh, I think there has been a lot of focus in relation to herd numbers over the course of the past while. Uh, but I think over the course of the past two years, national herd number has been falling. Um, so I think that, you know, it, 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 and you go back to the slide that I, that I talked about in relation to uh, kind of the repositioning of commercial forestry, every farm having to do woodland, every farm having to focus on, on the five sustainability pillars. And I think that when you, you know, they're all kind of elements of a Rubik's Cube. And if you start twirling them all to get the right green answer to scientific standard, and the key phrase here really is scientific standard. It, it, it can't just be green rhetoric in, in a policy document somewhere. It actually has to be to the metrics that sort of that generally that the EPA measure so scientific standard. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, Porik, I see uh, quite a lot of questions coming through there. Certainly, Mark, there's plenty. Um, no, one question just on that last image that you showed. Um, has that farmer uh, in, uh, experienced much of a reduction in productivity? And also then there's a question, just putting in buffer zones, sediment traps, leaving grass not grazed, etc. How are farmers, how do they feel about paying for those? Um, and what kind of buy-in are you getting? Yeah, so the, 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 the first question there, Look, I suppose there is a, a certain level of, of productivity loss there, but I suppose you, you could argue um, that might be more uh, palatable or, or more acceptable of a loss than we say, uh, for example, if there was a, 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 a some major policy change in, in the new cap or in the latest nitrates directive, where where you might have a, a you know cuts on cuts on, on what farmers can do. So I think you know it, it, it's 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 a sensible way of doing it. It's a practical way of doing it. It's it's the best way of doing it um, in my book. And you know, I think most farmers may explain the potential consequences uh, uh, if we don't get water quality improvement. They're uh, open to the idea of doing this kind of a, of a, of a buffering, uh, keeping back, putting the margins. You know, the, the buffers are really important. Sometimes people just play a lip service to them, but it's really important that we keep back the five meters. The ten meters that we put in the riparian margins to protect those are the those are the the airbags that we need you know for for the the, the time when a farmer can get caught out everybody can get caught out you know uh, with weather a downpour or whatever so these are the airbags that you need um I suppose the second part of the question there again or just as regards the cost of uh, of implementation you know and you talked about maintaining those as well like how yeah. do, how do you get buy in from the farmer to deliver on those yeah so look at when, when you'd be surprised at how how little cost there is to uh, when we hand over a plan to a farmer, um, you know it's very rare that we'd be asking a farmer to put up a a, a big capital capital investment into something. You know, for example, as a tank or something like that. Because what we're finding is, is that farmyard point source is, is is not as big an issue as, as people would, would imagine. It's more to diffuse. So what we're talking about here really is is practice change and behaviour change. So you know. We're talking about the shorter periods of the year that you put out. You, you, 
if the ground conditions and if the soil temperatures are not correct, that you do not go out with your nitrogen until, until they, they provide that. Otherwise, it's lying there and it has a chance of being leached. You know, likewise, at the, at the back end of the year, that you, you know, instead of going out to the 15th of September, that if the ground conditions and the, grow con uh, and the soil temperature and the soil moisture deficit is not appropriate, well, then you don't go out with it, you know. Um, so the, these, these are important message, messages. So there is a little bit of capital cost uh, on certain, some things that we ask farmers to do, but it's not massive. You know, it, it's by and large, it's quite cheap. It's, it's the most expensive thing that we're probably asking people to do is, is actually put up fences and put up, uh, um, you know, fence off cattle and maybe put an alternative drinking supplies. On occasions, there may be some farm roads that are having an impact. But th those are going to have to be moved anyway from the 1st of January next year with regards to the, the regulation. So, you know, that they're going to be bound by those anyway. So, look, okay, we, we, the cost of what we're asking farms to do is not massive at all. You know, it's more behavior change and practice change and doing, the, doing, their, doing their things differently as opposed to putting in massive expensive infrastructure. Oh. All, you, you, you mentioned um, like the, the positive impacts you're having on farm. Do you have any stats on kind of quantifying the positive impact you're having on farm level? And then you also said that you're moving away from a one size fits all. And mm. how do you scale that up to a national level or is it, is it possible? Yeah, well, I suppose that the, the, look, we're going to, a part of this series, the reason why we had the series and why we, why we, why we had the webinars that we had was to, to provide a, a level of, of information to the advisory service that's out there. And the ASAP advisors are focused in 190 areas for action, but, you know, that's, that's only, that's 40,000 farmers, give or take, right? And we wouldn't even be meeting all those 40,000 farmers, which just would not be possible. So we need the existing advisory service to take on the messages that we are trying to get out there um, and, and, ask, and ask that they make their farmers aware of these things. That's why I spoke about the uniform messaging from all, across all the industry and all the advisors. So that, that's really an important uh, thing to do, Corrie. Um, I suppose, you know, what we have at the minute is we, is we, we know the level of measures that we're asking farmers to do. So on average, there's, there's about six uh, six issues per farm that we're finding. So we go out and visit a farm, we see about six issues that we're asking a farmer that, that we say are having a, a definite impact on water quality. And through the process of, of, of discussion and speaking with the farmer, we come up with a plan and he, something that the farmer is happy with. And, you know, hope, you know, we, we, we send, it off, send it off with him and let him implement that as he goes along. And, you know, the, your previous question about implementation, you know, we haven't got final figures on that yet or any, we have some figures on that and by and large we're seeing that things are progressing along, uh, that farmers are implementing things and the farms that we've reassessed, but across the whole of, of the farmers, we don't have that yet because it just takes time to get through this. And just a question here, um, Noel and, and Joe, you might want to come in on this as well. I mean, how do you see the likes of the ASAP program program engaging or interacting with the likes of a future agri-environmental scheme or uh, eco scheme from the department uh, or the, under the, the new cap? Yeah, um, I suppose, look at, I, I think there, you know, there are learnings from the asset program that are out there, Mark. Um, I think, you know, we have, we have kind of two things going on here and, and Ginny D can kind of allude to it earlier on. You have, you have the nitrogen, uh, losses that are in the free draining uh, soils area and then you have your phosphorus and sediment losses in in the more uh, heavier soils around the you know the, the border areas and the west and, and and some parts of of, of the southwest as well and the northeast as well around me so you know you have two things going on here so you know maybe we need to look at um how we tailor our schemes or, or how we how we uh, what what measures are, are appropriate for a nitrogen loss situation? What measures are appropriate for a phosphorus loss situation? And, and that we, we try and come up with with plans or, or ways of, of of helping farmers to implement measures that will that will look at that. Another thing that I think that's going to become very important down the line is the identification of critical source areas. Um, I know there's a project going on out there. Um, Ian Thomas and UCD is working on it with the EPA, and I think that the findings that are going to be, uh, you know, are really, really important um, to help to give the tools to the advisor to be able to identify key areas on farms. Um, again, it's 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 instead of going to the one size fits all, it, it's it's identifying key areas, critical source areas that that are uh, have the potential impact on water quality. Um, you know, I think one other thing there that that maybe um, needs to be looked at is. The socioeconomic aspect of this, uh, part-time farming, uh, farmers that are that are marginal, 
you know, have they got the, the age profile of farmers, the succession of, of farmers? So I'm thinking of, you know, maybe an elderly farmer in the west of Ireland that doesn't have a successor, has low profitability, no help to do things. You know, can he, can we ask the same things of that, that farmer that we'd be asking a younger farmer? How do we help that older farmer to, to, to fence off streams? You know, he may need help to do that. He may, he may need money to do that. How do we help farmers in, in those kind of disadvantaged, poor socioeconomic uh, circumstances that people find? And, and the part-time farmer as well, you know, he's working maybe five or six days a week, you know, from, from eight, to, eight to seven. How is he supposed to maintain his farm uh, to the standard that we're asking to do that. So is there an area there that we need to look at which try and help that then kind of cohorts of farmers? So I suppose it's about identifying the different cohorts that are out there and, and uh, tailoring the, the advice and, and the help and the assistance and the schemes to meet those cohorts. Joe, do you have any comments on that, just to, yeah. on the, the policy side? I think that there is something to be said for upskilling the, uh, the ASAP advisors uh, in, in relation to things like biodiversity and climate change. I think that's kind of inevitable. But more broadly, I think there is more to be said for upskilling the existing entire knowledge transfer cohort across the state with the entire Chagask advisory system to integrate sustainability for every single Chagask advisor. Same for the Department of Ag. Uh, same for the private advisors who are out there. There's quite a big cohort of private advisors. And for every farm facing element of the co-op as well, that everybody incorporates and internalizes and advises uh, and knowledge transfers and networks in relation to good sustainability practice. It can't just be down to the asset guys, they're too small, it's too small a cadre. It needs everybody. Porik, lots of questions. There's lots of questions there, Mark. Yeah. Um, Joe, another one for you. You quoted a figure of 14% um, for, I suppose, optimum soil fertility. Uh, you mentioned that there's some distance to go before all the soils are at peak productivity. Is that not going against sustainability principles? Peak productivity sounds like more fertilizers are needed. Um, please, exp please explain what you mean. I guess they're looking at the biodiversity of soils. If you'd like to comment yeah. on that, John, please. I guess I, this was a big surprise to me when I started to look at this a few, about two years ago, that the actual structure of the soil, because the pH is wrong, most of the soils are in the wrong productivity uh, elements just by virtue of the, of the structure themselves. And you can fix the P, the, the pH and the structure of the soil by changing the pH. Uh, and that is about lime, which is very, very cheap. Uh, and the more, uh, and if you get the pH of your soil right, uh, then you don't need chemical N uh, to the same degree. So I think that really is where there's a huge win. Uh, and that's why kind of the program, why there is kind of compulsory liming programs now from, from, for derogation farmers. But I think all farmers need to look at lime to a far greater degree and to move away rather substantially from the use of chemical N uh, and to use their manure and their slurry and so on and so forth in a more, in a more focused way. But I think that there, there's a huge win there without losing productivity. It isn't just about firing chemical N out all over the place. It, it can't be that anymore. Okay, you mentioned, Joe, um, the sustainability bonuses from Dairy Gold and the biodiversity for bonus from Glanbia. What was the kind of the uptake, well, not the uptake, but how were they received by farmers? And do you think that's something that we're going to see more of in the future? I think, it, I think they were well received, uh, but, and I think that it, it has to be in the policy mix that you know, farmers have to be rewarded for what they do. That, that has been kind of the language, both in relation to CAP and in relation to grant schemes and so on and so forth, but equally in relation to, 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 to checks from the co-ops. So I think, it, it, it'll, I, think it's pro, I think it'll have to be in the mix. There has to be discussion on this. Kind of as a, as a kind of support farm. Unfortunately, hey. we're, time is against us, uh, gentlemen. Um, it's hard to believe the hour has gone. Um, we have really a lot, a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get to today. Um, but what I can say is that we, we are going to study the questions because there are some really thought-provoking questions coming in through today. So we'll circulate them amongst the, the panel we, we'll discuss and, and hopefully uh, get back to people if, if we're, we're necessary. Mark. Yes, Sorry, of course. No, yeah. I, I just had a quick look at one of the questions somebody asked, are we only dealing with dairy farmers? No, we deal with all farmers. Yeah, in, in, that's in an important asset. point. It's not just dairy, it, it, it's all farmers. So and you're also working point. in collaboration with the farm organization as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, like we, the farm orgs have been brilliant, you know, they, they have really got behind us and, you know, 
their in, in, impact locally has, has really helped our engagement with the farmers, you know, so, uh, you know, they've all come to step up to plate in this one now. Okay. Look, uh, mention, well, I, I mentioned firing out fertilizer. I used the wrong phrase. I just meant kind of sort of the nutrient use efficiency. My apologies. It's like that's, different. That's, that's no, no problem at all. Thanks for that clarification, uh, Joe. T Noel, thank you very much, Joe. Thank okay. you for your presentation. Porik, thanks for helping with the questions today. And thank you for tuning in, uh, our audience, uh, for a lot of repeat uh, viewers uh, this, this week. So it's great to, to have uh, so many people joining us every week. Um, just to remind you that the presentation is available on the Changus web, will be available shortly on the Changus website. I want to thank our uh, production team, Andy Boland, Pat Murphy, Yvonne Maher, uh, and of course, Noel for assisting with this part of the series as well. Uh, we'll be with you next week uh, again at the same time. Uh, just to remind you, if you want to uh, avail of the, the Chagas Connected, you can sign up to Chagas Connected today for free uh, by going to the Chagas website and chagas.ie forward slash connected. And uh, you can avail of a free newsletter, monthly news newsletter, which gives, gives you updates on new web webinars and activities that are happening uh, that, that Chagas is broadcasting over the, the coming weeks and months ahead. So with that, uh, thanks uh, for tuning in and uh, we will see you again next Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagas Signpost Series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.